time I've done one of these Zoom. This is the first time I've done one of these Zoom things. Um, uh, so I'm nervous about it. And if if all hell breaks loose, uh, it's Deb's fault. No, it's not. <laughs> so we want to. Uh, give you a special thanks for doing this because um, often the therapists that we work with in RSOI say things to us like, I didn't sign up to be a presenter when I became, uh, you know, when I became a school therapist. So we know it's a stretch, but go ahead and share your screen and okay. we'll get started. Uh, we'll get started. Uh, there we go. Are we there? Uh, now we are yes okay yeah so um I'm, I'm not used to not having people's faces either but that's all right we're, we're good here um when they first asked me about doing this um ultimately you know i've done it for the schools that i've been in but i haven't done any of the kind of um the research behind it or looked at any of the kind of really big stuff behind it you know i just did what all the therapists do and just do it do what i can um so um, pretty much I'm learning this as you are so if you've got ideas let me get let me know okay so you know the first real step in this is what what does a real emergency look like um, and and truthfully I've no idea so I, I've been in multiple different locations and multiple different settings and uh, I, I've not been in a real emergency just thousands of drills now, it is incredibly rare to have an emergency that requires evacuation, not lockdown in a school. And I'm not going to talk about lockdown today. So what we're talking about today is uh, equipment that we could use um, to help kids get out of buildings. And ultimately, in lockdown, the only thing is do what the police tell you to do and you can use the lift. So you can, you know, pretty much you can just get them out of the building however you normally get them out of the building. So... Most of the big studies are done on big natural disasters. Um, the ones that I looked at, they were mostly Katrina. Um, there's some warning in that. Um, and there's a lot of difference between the ones with warning and the unpredictable evacuations like fires and tornadoes and earthquakes. So the studies are not of schools, but are big multi-story hospitals with a wide range of patients. Um, they all involve triage and people do die. So, um, that's the 90 day mortality rate. It's somewhere, bet somewhere between two and 3% of people, uh, somewhere between two and 3% increase in the 90 day mortality. But there are some lessons that we get from these studies that hold true across the board. Uh, all of the studies at the end said that if we had less warning, all of this would be worse. Everything would be worse. Uh, just that's how it works. And I think nobody's arguing that. We didn't need the research to tell us that. So there are psychosocial things that happen. People group. People want to move in groups. Um, and it makes anywhere where there's a bottleneck harder. So if you're trying to evacuate downstairs or through doorways, um, people try to be together. People also try and group with like individuals. And this is not race or color or size or any of those sorts of things. People who know where they're going tend to group with people who know where they're going. People who don't know where they're going tend to group with people who don't know where they're going, which is a problem. So the other problem is I think we're hurting that um, people who are unfamiliar with the evacuation route or we change the route will follow people, even if it's wrong. Then you have rescuing. So it's incredibly difficult to predict. Um, yes, we needed people to go back to assist slower evacuees but going back for people increases the mortality. In, uh, in movies, they do it all the time. In reality, they don't do it. Nobody does a Saving Private Ryan thing where you lose a whole company of soldiers for a single soldier. It doesn't make sense. It's just stupid. So where you run into trouble with high schools is that high school students go back for their brothers or sisters, particularly if they're worried about them for some reason, and unfortunately, you mostly lose the person going back because the one that they're going back for is already out in the staging area. Then the other big psychosocial um, situation is information sharing. So it can be altruistic. You need to go help this person. This doorway is blocked. 
But rumors are a nightmare and it makes rescue difficult to triage. So it's hard to go from there. Real emergency, and this is, this is clear, real emergency are always more rushed, more chaotic and less controlled than the drill. I mean, we do drills all the time, but we have no idea what it looks like when it gets to be real. So what we do know of these multi-victim events is that they're not even vaguely representative of reality. So drill, we can drill and it makes us all feel better. And, and at the same time, we need to do all the predictive stuff before there's an emergency. So people panic, even those in charge. People don't think rationally. People in charge are occupied or injured. Evacuation routes are blocked. Um, and then there's the psychological effect is we're never prepared for that. We're particularly not prepared for that in the case of children. If we're trying to evacuate children, all of that fear and noise and, and debris and all those sorts of things bump up their adrenaline and kids are definitely harder to deal with when they're, higher, when they're scared. And then there are injuries from the evacuation itself. So what's the problem with schools? The, the players aren't stable. They've never been stable. We don't even try and make them stable. So teachers and aides move, kids move to different classrooms. There's multiple different evacuation requirements that may happen in the same room. So, um, you know, and I just put visual impairment compared to kids in wheelchairs or those sorts of things. But if you think about it, you know, you could have a room with three different possible evacuation requirements. And we're dealing with children or worse, teenagers. <laughs> and uh, I have a teenage boy and I can assure you, even when we're not in trouble, the, the frontal lobe's not working particularly well. So emotional maturity and cognition and everything at that point varies widely. Uh, and that's before you add disability. And then schools are old. Certainly our schools are all old and they're not well set up for evacuation. Um, so I put the numbers there of what, what we're looking at. Uh, our hospital in Roseburg, Mercy Medical Center, has only 174 non-combatants that they need to evacuate in a big emergency. Johns Hopkins, which is one of the bigger hospitals in USA, has only 1,091. Um, and Roseburg High School has nearly 1,600 kids with a student-teacher ratio of 22.5 to 1. So it's not really fair to compare these big hospitals. Um, the hospitals all have nurses who sit in the unit that they're in, they've been trained in the unit, in evacuation for the unit that they're in. Um, the people are all in the beds that they're supposed to be in, barring a few outliers. But that is just not true of schools, not on any level. So how do we problem solve it? You know, the first part is about the layout of the schools. Um, one of the things that I talk about is pre-pre-planning for, for drills and pre-pre-planning for evacuations. Uh, ultimately, if you have a DLC or one of the big, uh, the heavily um, disabled classrooms um, up on the third floor, then it needs to move. So ultimately, you're never going to get a whole classroom of kids down the stairs in an emergency. But schools can be organized so that you put those classrooms on the ground floor. Now suddenly you can get them out. So the other thing is that what does the staging area look like? Um, and I'm using all these terms, I assume everybody knows them. The staging area is the point, the very far point at which you stop. Um, and everybody then connects and then you do roll and all those sorts of things. So that's the staging area. Then it's gonna depend on the nature of the child, the nature of the disability, the nature of the staff, and then what equipment options. And we sort of talked a bit about the drills and the actual emergency. So when we start with the schools, the equipment has to match the layout and be flexible. So the other thing that we need to remember as therapists is that there is no school district that can buy a new piece of equipment for every child. That's just not how it works. And we don't have that kind of money. Um, and the only thing that really does stay stable in all of that, because kids move through the school and then graduate and disabilities change. The only thing that actually doesn't change is the school layout and the location of the staging areas. So if you can manipulate that to begin with, then you're already three streets ahead. If you don't have to take anybody down a lift or downstairs, 
you really win. But you can do that. Schools are more than happy to hear that. So for this presentation, we're going to assume that it's the hardest possible option, that it's in a multi-story building and that they require some sort of mobility assistance. Single story evacuation is really easy. Um, if there are questions about the complex ones, let me know and we can problem solve them at the end. But ultimately you just take them out the door in whatever it is that they're in. So I didn't want to kind of waste too much time on that because we don't have a whole lot of time. But if you've got questions, please let me know. Okay, equipment options. What are we going to move? <laughs> it's the, it is the big question. Are we moving just the child or are we moving the child and the chair? Now, moving the child is just generally the quickest and often the cheapest. Um, but if you have a child who's not mobile, it means that you have to work out what you're gonna do when you get them to the staging area. Now, in a real emergency, it probably just doesn't matter, but in a drill, it really does. And in a real emergency kind of rules, I get it, you know, we have to follow what we can, but ultimately, if you need to go back for someone else, you will just leave them on the grass. So um, when you move the child in a real emergency, they'll probably lose whatever the mobility assistance that they're using at the moment, that will probably be gone permanently. If you're moving the child in the chair, it's heavier and generally more expensive, but you can actually save the chair in a real emergency. So uh, there are different pros and cons for all of them. And I'm just gonna go through them one by one um, and we'll talk about which children will probably use what options. So, who would we move just the child? Um, and, and really the first question is, how do I move the child normally? Uh, and there are your options. They kind of walk independently, but fatigue. They walk with a walker well, and it's easy to access like a K walker, or they walk poorly and it's difficult to access like a pacer. So it's about how much time is it gonna take you to get them in a walker? If, it's, if you have to lift them in and do all sorts of fancy, you know, uh, buckles up and those sorts of things like paces and some of the big uh, kid walks and those sorts of things, it's unlikely that you would use that. Particularly is that you're probably going to have to go downstairs, so someone's going to have to get that walker down the stairs anyway. The next, uh, the next one is stand pivot transfers. So if you, um, if you have kids who are stand pivot transferring, you can often get them into something that will get them down the stairs quickly. And with hoists, I'll, I'll talk about why we just moved the child for that as well, but how much support do they require? And then the big question for all of these children, how fast do they normally get from A to B? Where am I moving them to? How far away is it? How many stairs are involved? Is it over grass? Is it over mud? I have one school where it's literally over mud and then through a creek. So, you know, am I going to take a power chair through a creek? No, I'm not. <laughs> you know, and, and in fact, in one of the things that we're doing is actually changing that staging area because that pre-pre-planning, it doesn't make any sense to be doing that. Uh, and then how many staff am I going to need per child? You know, we're going to need to do a lot of staff training because staff move around, aides move around, you know, everybody needs to know how to do it. And then the other one that gets forgotten a lot, and I really don't want you to forget it, is the duty of care to staff. It's really important that we're not asking them to do these complicated twisting lifts, that they're going to hurt them. The whole point of this is that we're not hurting anyone. And staff are important, and staff are going to have to get them all the way out to the staging area. So if you hurt them putting somebody in some piece of equipment, it's incredibly hard to get both them and that kid out then. All right, just the child. I use transport chairs a lot, pretend chairs, not real chairs. So I'll show you the chair that I use a lot. Um, transport chairs for ambulatory or partially ambulatory, ambulatory children um, and those doing kind of consistent stand pivot transport transfers, they are really cheap. They're cheaper than you think that they are. They sit folded in the back of the classroom. They're never used except in a drill or in an emergency. Um, and a chair doesn't have to fit them. So it can, it can go up with the child or it can get switched out for different children. 
Um, and you can just bump a manual chair downstairs. It's really easy. It does require practice, but it's, it is really easy. And frankly, I'm sure we've all done it. Um, it requires at most two people, one person in front and one person behind. Um, and then it gives this kid, the kids a zone of protection around them in a real emergency. And you're gonna hear me talk about zone of protection a lot. If we go back to what does a drill look like and what does a real emergency look like? Stairs are gonna be filled with children. I have to get nearly 1600 chairs out of Roseburg High, uh, 1600 kids out of Roseburg High, and there's about four stairwells. So do I think that my disabled child is going to be able to negotiate that without some sort of protection? And the real answer is no. So some of the kids that I have in these chairs walk just fine. They just fatigue or they'd get knocked over. So what do they look like? They're 250 bucks. So Amazon has them. The school's more than happy to buy them. Um, and they fold up. They don't go on buses. They're not designed for any of that. They're designed to be used about twice or twice a year in drills, but ultimately, you know, twice. Um, and they're just very basic. They're chairs with a seatbelt and that's all. Now, if you need a heap of trunk support and things like that, we can't use that. But at the same time, you know, there are a lot of kids out there that don't need that. And we just need to get them out fast. And those chairs and multiple other options are on Amazon and on uh, adaptive malls and all those sorts of things. Those cheap chairs are out there. So which child? So which child are we going to put in there? So we kids with fatigue, visual impairments, they, we walk them to that manual chair and put them in. If they're partially ambulatory, I don't bother. I walk the chair to them and put them in the chair. So they'll transfer into the chair if they're in a power chair and they can stand pivot transfer, I'll transfer them to the manual chair. And if they've got their own manual chair, all the better, then they're gonna keep the chair. So the child can assist with braking as the chair drops to the stair below. And then once outside, you've actually got somewhere to put the kids. So when we're talking about these kids, who have I got in those chairs? Uh, I have a kid with uh, mitochondrial myopathy. He walks just fine. Um, he plays in the playground, but he fatigues. And if he goes into a mito crash, which he would likely do under that kind of stress, I need some way of transporting him. Uh, I have uh, a kid who's got a, a brain tumor and she doesn't see, and she would needs the zone of protection. So yes, she can walk as fast and she is, has no fatigue, but ultimately I need to get her out fast. And I need to make sure that no one's going to knock her down the stairs. Even though she can do stairs by herself, asking her to do those stairs during an emergency is asking for trouble. The other reason why I, I use those sorts of chairs is uh, that the last thing I want, you've got one teacher, maybe one teacher and an aide and 26 kids. We have a duty of care, not just to the disabled child in that classroom, but to the other 25 kids. They have to get out too. And if you take two adults to take them out, where are the other 25 kids? What do we do with them? You know, they're still important just because you've got a disability doesn't make you more important or less important than anybody else. We need to get everybody out. And so when you have those kinds of chairs, you can actually put the two adults on the chair with the kids behind the other kids behind them so that you've actually got a zone of protection now, not just for the child in the chair but for that classroom as well. So they can join kind of a, a caterpillar line. So does anybody have any questions about that? Because I'm about to switch on to switch off. Um, Sue, there is a conversation happening in the chat um, about the staging areas. Yeah. Um, Deb had said, I've heard that the staging area and reunification is part of the planning that often gets slighted. Um, and Alex, who has joined us today, says, uh, absolutely, we've seen uh, where a school decides to assemble at an area that, like you mentioned, that that's a mud puddle or yeah. across a creek or something like that, but also in places that interfere with the emergency vehicles. Right. Um, 
So if yeah, so if you guys can be a part of that conversation, that's that's where that's really good. And and ultimately, it's really nice to be able to sit down in those conversations with the principals, even if they've not started the conversation. You can actually start it based on kids with disability, but actually extend it to kids where this whole thing is nuts. Why are we putting them in front of where the ambulances would come? Okay. Why are we putting? Yeah. So that's how I that's how, how I've addressed it, and it's how I've changed the staging areas in the places that we've needed to have it changed. Um, it's actually, I don't know if you've been on when Alex has been with us before, but I'm thrilled to have Alex, um, who, uh, and he, you can introduce yourself and say what your role is, but I think that you've also invited some of the other statewide trainers who work with the uh, communities, uh, some of the names I see on. So that's why I posed this to Alex, but Alex, go ahead and just introduce yourself so uh, we all know who is sitting in with us today. All right, sure, Deb. Thank, thanks. Yeah, uh, Sue and everybody else. My, my name is Alex Hazel. I'm the uh, School Safety and Emergency Management uh, Program Manager for ODE, and uh, we do have trainers across the state that, uh, that that help with this very kind of thing. And, and Sue, I was just getting ready to type into the chat. This is a fantastic presentation. I love that you're addressing a lot of these things that a lot of people don't recognize and, and think about. And uh, when, when they're talk, when they're thinking about, hey, how do we actually get folks out? Uh, of our schools. So, uh, and I was going to say, I'm going to have to steal some of this because uh, this is definitely some stuff that we need to share. Uh, no, you're more than welcome to. I'm... We're recording, we're sharing, and, and that's what's important here is that we're all at the table for these conversations. So I just wanted you to know that there is a connection to bigger pictures that are happening here. And Alex and his team have been part of these discussions uh, for since we began them. Um, so there is a a uh, question in the chat, where do you keep evacuation chairs in a high school where students move around a whole bunch? How, what, how do you handle that situation where the- uh, I, I tend to there? take it with the kid. So um, what, what I do is uh, just have either somebody bringing it to different places or um, the other one I've done is juggling classrooms. So uh, you can actually juggle classrooms so that um, the four people that need a chair and, and in every year there's always three or four, you just have them only going to those four rooms and you're juggling the teachers then a little bit. So most of the time I've had really good results with that. So in high school, I just get 18 inch chairs, put them in the rooms. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say too is that the other one I'm using uh, a chair, like a manual chair like that for, uh, is a little guy who has one of the dwarfing syndromes and uh, he's in grade one and he's about the size of a two-year-old. Uh, so he can, he can walk and he can do everything that all the other kids are doing, but in an actual emergency, he's going to get trampled. So in an actual emergency, I put him in a chair. Because I, I get it, he can get out by himself, he can do everything he needs himself, but in an actual emergency, nobody's looking out for the two-year-old. And uh, I had a kind of long discussion with the, the, the principal where, in fact, I put my foot down. Uh, he wanted to buy an umbrella stroller and use that. And I'm like, you know what, this two-year-old's been treated like a baby for his whole life. The last thing we need is for him to be doing this during every drill, is to be put into a, a stroller and, uh, and go from there. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure there will be more questions. Let's- uh... That's all right, let's keep going. Uh, and then we have all the other ones. So there are stair chairs. So I, you know, I'm, I do pros and cons of most of these things. Uh, stair chairs are specifically designed for evacuation downstairs. As they get more expensive, the tracks are braked. So as they get, so the cheap ones, these 350 ones, uh, are just chair, are just two wheeled. The bottom, the bottom picture are just two wheels, and you, you bump them down the stairs. And uh, as you get further and further up, you get tracks. So yeah, there are four thousand dollar stair chairs, um, and they're safer than a manual chair to get them downstairs. That said, they're 4K and we're back to the whole, am I gonna put one of those in every room? Uh, probably not. Am I gonna take it back up to the top to get the second child? Absolutely not. Um, they don't fold well, they're expensive and they require extensive training because the braking is really hard to, 
to maneuver. And once you get them outside, you got to put them in something else. So they can't do uneven ground. They can't get to the staging area. They're really Im impossible to move. And the easiest way to, to move a stair chair is to tilt it backwards and actually drag it back behind from behind you. And uh, it's not a good way in an emergency to be keeping an eye on the kids. So uh, I don't tend to use them. Um, when I had to do this presentation, uh, I didn't know enough about it. So I did what I always do in these presentations and ask the hive mind. And if you guys are not on the, the Facebook group, Physi um, physical and occupational school therapists, please get on it. Because if I haven't done it, somebody has. Um, and I just asked them and I got a lot of information from around the States, which was really nice. Um, and only one, only one of those people had bought a chair specifically for stairs. And it was for a child who was always in the same classroom, always with the same aids. And that, that chair was a $4,000 chair. I, and, and they're a rich New York school district, which, uh, is not my school district. So um, then you have power evacuation. This is the, you're getting higher and higher in cost. Then you have power evacuation chairs. Now it, it does reduce the lifting. It's weight rated significantly higher. So you can get to 600 pounds on those and it completely controls the descent. So you can put them at the top of the stairs and essentially leave them, although you never would. Um, and the the stair chair, that, that power evacuation chair will go down the stairs. Again, the training significantly more extensive. Um, I don't want you to leave them anyway. And the cost is exorbitant and they're impossible once you get out, out, outside to maneuver you know, at all. Can you tell us what, uh, when a thing like that might actually be useful? I mean- In, in, uh, in, in hospitals. Uh, yeah, so there, there are, um, and, and there are things here that talk about evacuations and I wanted to show them to everybody, but ultimately I'm not saying to buy any of these things. Right, I was just... Yeah, no, it, it, those sorts of things, nursing homes, those sorts of things, they have those, um, but they tend to use them in those, uh, for want of a better word, slow emergencies. How do I get this person, you know, from here to here, the lifts aren't working. But somebody has to take it back to the top for the second person. And, uh, and all of those sorts of things, which kind of, I think, defeats the purpose. So, yeah, clearly they're used because they exist. Um, and yeah. even, in, even in the hospital evacuation drills that I was in, and, and in all honesty, the, the evacuation drills that I was in in hospitals were about intensive care. So I, uh, I spend most of my time in hospitals in pick you in NICU, the, the little, little kid intensive cares, which is more about how do we get them out alive than it is about how do we carry them down the stair. So, um, yeah, so Gail, I don't, I don't see, I don't, I don't even know why they exist. Truthfully, they do. And, you know, truthfully, most of the people on here aren't going to be the ones purchasing and clicking to buy, yeah. but having an awareness of what is out there. And if you are asked for an opinion or if maybe these conversations aren't being had in your areas and you're able to push them, uh, then letting other people to uh, sharing this with those people uh, can help bring a better awareness. So it's all about some PD for all of us, Sue. You're giving us yeah. exactly what we need. So then the, then the big question for these are, you know, which children, the ones with no trunk control. Ultimately, um, if they don't have trunk control and they're in a power chair. So if they don't have trunk control and they're in a manual chair that somebody's pushing, just take it down the stairs. Um, but these are kids with poor trunk control needing support in the chair that you can't provide somehow in the manual chair. Um, in these circumstances, I would just buy a better manual chair <laughs> than to buy a five and a half K uh, power, power chair. Um, if the kids are 600 pounds, then you're going to be in trouble regardless. Um, and you're going to need probably four adults to get a manual chair like that down the stairs uh, to keep it safe. It requires uh, at least, yeah. There's a question uh, from Linda. Would you ever use a sturdy chair? Um, 
that's not a wheelchair have multiple people help carry the student down the stairs and just lift the chair yeah and, absolutely no and and, and i've used uh, you know one of the things i'm going to talk about a little bit later is just using the hoist sling and picking the sling up so yeah. you know i i do that so I, i've done that quite a quite a large number of times because the hoist sling is already under these kids most of the time it sits there the kids are really used to it and they're really easy to pick up so uh i'll talk about that a bit later but ultimately all of those kinds of things are, are things that i would do well before I would do any of these million dollar things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not suggesting that this, that, that anybody gets this. And yeah, I mean, the school district that did buy, they didn't buy the power one, but that did buy the 4,000 K striker chair. Uh, they were very rich and um, it, it was more about lawsuits than it was about, um, than it was about evacuation. Does anyone have any questions about those? Because <laughs> uh, I'm happy to go on. I'm just going to um, make a quick comment, if that's okay. Yeah. When your slide that you had about the stair chair. Yeah. Um, there was two kinds. There was the striker chair and then the one with the little tiny wheels in the back. Yeah. But both of those kinds of chairs. <clears throat> so I will say my school district bought um, the striker chairs for every school that had stairs. It's sitting in the um, place of refuge at the top of the stairs. And of course, then the kid has to be able to get to that place of refuge because you don't know in an emergency if that, for some reason, that piece of the hallway is going to be blocked. Yeah. Along with the four people who have already been trained to use it. Say it again. Uh, along with the four people who have already been trained to use it. Well, that right. may so well not be with the trained people. Well, so we do organize that and we just, you know, hope. Yeah. There's not a substitute the day that there's an emergency, but I will say that um, one of the advantages, if you and you might talk about this later, but if you have a student in a power wheelchair that needs to get down the stairs and you use the striker chair um, or the stair chair, it does have handles in the front and the back. So then when you get them to the bottom of the stairs, they also still have to get all the way out the building and all the way to their meeting place. And if they can't walk and if they're a 250 pound kid, right. those chairs are helpful because you can carry the actual chair. There's really good handles at the foot and the back. So I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but um, the people we've trained are really, they are good at it. And as long as he- oh, can That's great. I mean, I'm glad that, that it's working somewhere. That's the whole reason for doing this is that that, that works. Yeah, you know, but, if that's working for your school district, that's great. Yes, but my favorite part of your whole discussion so far is that I've never been in an emergency either, and we're just, the psychological part of it, that was super good to think about, because we can only plan as best we can, but anyway, thank you. No, you're, you're welcome, uh, and then and then we got other non-chair options. The other thing that, that I do sometimes with these non-chair options um, is that you can, you can have manual chairs or power chairs or other options down the bottom. Um, and one of the things that I talked about with one of the kids was to not allow to use the lift, but it doesn't stop you putting the power chair in the lift. So what we were doing, the, power, the stairs and the lift were right next to each other. And so what we would do is take, um, take the whole system to the child and the power chair to the lift uh, lift them out. In fact, I was using her hoist sling. Um, and then we put the, the power chair in the lift and just push down. And if you lose it, you lose it. But if you don't lose it, by the time you get to the bottom, you've actually got a power, her own power chair to put her in. So, um, you know, those sorts of options are options as well if the lifts are right there. The last thing you want to be doing is to be carrying these kids long, long distances. So there's another comment uh, in the chat. Greta, do you want to unmute yourself and, and say what you wrote? I think it might be more useful. Yeah, I just, I had a question. So our fire marshal has preferred a plan where our students in wheelchairs wait at the top of the stairs with a staff member with a walkie until 
emergency personnel get there. And I get it. I mean, we're in an urban area, so we're very close to a, our emergency personnel, but it still seems unsafe to me. That sounds very unsafe to me. It also, um, I, I'd be nervous in a lawsuit for FAPE because uh, the other kids are allowed to get out, but they're not. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'd struggle with that one. I mean, if you if you have a fire or something and you're waiting all of those kids at the top of the stairs, uh, A, you're blocking the stairs, and uh, B, that's absolute discrimination. I agree. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I would be very, I'd be very against that. Also, I mean, how do you know that this is not an earthquake or something where it's a citywide option? You know, you need to get the kids out. It's not, yeah, waiting for, you know, waiting for somebody to show up uh, is a nightmare. But, you know, that's that's my opinion. And I am opinionated, I will admit. Okay. Uh, so there are lifters out there. Um, they're cheap. You can roll them in the backpack of the child and uh, they're designed to actually take the weight of the child through the shoulders. So two people can do it. So you can walk them down the stairs in this. Um, they will tilt if you just change where, change where the um, shoulder holder is. So that if you pull those shoulder holders forward slightly, it actually tilts the chair. Um, and then you can hold on with one hand, hold on with the shoulder and hold the rail, which is the other important thing, because you're asking these people to go downstairs carrying weight. Duty of care says that that's a nightmare. And uh, the more support that we can give them to do that, the better off we are. So the weight capacity of that one there is 220 pounds. Um, you need to get good quality. So there are ones out there where the, the handles rip off and those sorts of things. You just need to find the ones that work. That said, I just use the slings. So any, any kid that's needing to be transferred like that, I use the slings anyway. If you look at the back sling of that, that Hoya, the, the head sling, um, you can actually put that over your shoulder. So for the amount of time that it's going to be getting them down, uh, you can take most of the weight through the shoulders, through your shoulder. And many of the slings actually have handles in the back um, that you can hold. They're designed to pull them back into the chair when you're, um, when you're putting them back into a chair. But ultimately, you can hold that and hold the front. So they're already partially trained. It's already there. Um, if they're not using them already, you can just roll them up, put them in a backpack. Um, and there's no increased cost because they're already being used most of the time. They're already weight matched for the sling. Um, yeah, so I use that a little bit. I had a little, uh, a little girl. I had a, a senior who had arthrogryposis and um, we decided to do that. Oh, and the other thing I, you know, I do a lot of this with the high school kids if they're capable, if they're cognitively capable, we problem solve with the child. So they need to buy in or it's not, it, it doesn't work. And, uh, and with this, this little girl, um, she said, oh, she looked at me and she goes, oh, so you know, in an earthquake, this is Roseburg High, it'll all just come down. I'll be the only one that survives because of my power chair. And, uh, and I was a bit with her, but at the same time, uh, we had to get her down three flights of stairs um, with a sling. And it was, you know, they don't have any trouble lifting those. So staff is really good at that. They understand how to use it. They know how to use the Hoya um, by crossing the legs and all those sorts of things. The training is significantly less. So which children? These are the fully dependent ones. So ultimately, you're going to have to put them on the ground when you arrive to the staging area. So let's hope you're not in the creek again. But uh, ultimately, in a real emergency, which is always the difference, um, it may well be the, the right option. Do you have any questions about that? I, I don't see anything in the chat Sweet. right now. All righty. Most of these are things I've never considered before. So until I can roll it around in my brain, I have no idea what I don't know. Okay. Then there's non-chair non options. So uh, I've trained a lot with med sleds, um, but only in hospitals. Uh, they're light. They're, they're somewhere between $250 and $1,000. Um, and it depends on the complexity of them. Um, med sleds are designed... Uh, to 
be rigid, but rollable. And so you roll them and put them in the corner of the classroom. And uh, the slick bottom means that you can get, down the, get them down the stairs. They have a super high weight capacity. So you can put a thousand pounds on there, which means that you can put multiple pieces of equipment. Um, and once, once the kid's on the floor, they don't require lifting or they have handles that let you lift. The problem is that not, these are designed for hospitals. In hospital, people are in bed. So you roll the patient over, log roll the patient over, you put it underneath and then you, you drop their feet down and you drop them in, into the, onto the floor. Now, that doesn't happen at school. So at school, they're either in a wheelchair or they're in a chair. They're not lying on a bed very often. And if they are, it would be a miracle that they had an had a emergency at the same time. It requires a really tricky transfer from the chair. So you would have to go from up here with the chair, and now you're going to have to actually put them on the ground without destroying your back. So that tricky transfer is one that I'm always, it's, it's part of the reason why I, I would never do it. I think that it's not fair to the staff doing it. Um, and it requires training of multiple staff to accu accurately use the braking tether. Now, whenever you watch the videos of all of these things, there's these kind of beautiful videos of them using this braking tether to go down the stairs and things like that. And my problem is, is that there's no zone of protection on these sorts of things. They're on the ground when everybody else is stampeding past them. Now, even in the videos, there's just the one thing on the stair and there's two people assisting and it's all beautiful and there's lovely soft music in the background and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. But that is not reality. The reality is we have three stairwells and 1,500 kids. So how are you going to do that without having some kid fall on that kid? Because they're on the ground. And part of, the, part of what I do is like, I mean, you can't, I'm back at, I'm not going to wait to take the disabled kid out. You know, I'm not going to wait at the top of the stairs. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. You need clear stairwells to use them, which is great for a hospital. You know, in hospitals where you've got three days warning because Katrina's coming in. Uh, it's great. You can take them out quite easily. You know, they're heavy. They, you can put the equipment on there. You know, that's great. But in schools, I just, I couldn't even think of a time when I would use it uh, because I thought it wasn't fair to the staff and I thought that it wasn't fair to the child once they were in it on the ground. So what do we do when we have equipment attached to a child? So, uh, or we could go back to the med sleds if you want. Sorry, I, I forgot to, I forgot to stop there and and see if you guys had any questions. I didn't see any questions. Okay, uh, yeah. Sorry for slamming the med sled, but I, you know, I, I've done lots of training on it, and and I just can't see it working in, in, in a school. So regularly we have kids with equipment attached. Um, Anything that's non-life-saving is disconnected and discarded in a real emergency. So feeding pumps, you just, you don't even have to stop it. It doesn't matter at that point. In an emergency, you just, you just disconnect it from the G-tube. Uh, you want to stop it, great. It doesn't matter. You're leaving it behind anyway. If you come back and there's food on the floor, it doesn't matter. Um, monitors and those sorts of things can be left behind. However, we have kids that are life-saving equipment. We can shift it to battery and it's got to come with the child. But if you have children like this, you're very much going to need some training. So if you have kids on ventilators and, and Douglas School District has one at the moment. So if you have kids on ventilators or BiPAP, so BiPAP's life-saving as well, then uh, if there's no battery backup or um, for some reason it's not working, then you're going to need how uh, need training on how to use the alternative. So you need a lot of people and a lot of training. So it, it's two people to carry the kid uh, and then two people to save their lives. One's got a seal and one's got an amber bag. So when you're, here's the experience from the, the intensive care. So when you're transporting kids that are on ventilators, uh, you don't want to, you don't want the person who's trying to bag and keep them alive, keep the seal because you're walking at the same time. So what you do is have uh, somebody holding the seal on from the head level. 
and somebody ambu bagging beside while you're carrying them out in the sling. That makes sense? Lots of training, lots and lots of training. Um, and generally you're not the one training, but if, if they've got a ventilator, they've probably got a one-on-one -on -one aid um, and they're likely got a nurse somewhere nearby as well. So they'll probably be the ones doing the bagging, but you're gonna have to work out egress around that. Suction equipment is also life-saving equipment um, and then medications need, needs to come with you, particularly seizure medication, but there's other medication, you know, any number of medications that you can't leave behind because a kid can't survive without them. Okay, all of that makes sense? Training, training, training. That's what I heard. Right, it's training, training, training. Yeah, and that that sort of thing. I mean, if you're not comfortable around ventilators and if you're not comfortable around ambu bags and if you're not comfortable around seals, then don't be the one doing it. Or train, 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 train. That's what it's going to look like. Okay, drills aren't real life. The kids aren't where they're supposed to be. Someone's away sick. You've got a sub. The sub, you know, we got three days ago because we finally found a sub. It's raining, it's hailing, it's muddy. There's no prep time for autistic children, which we are using all the time in drills. So in drills, we give the autistic kids time. We give them warning. Um, the kids can be in, not in their chairs. So the standards, changing tables, doing treatments, you know, any of those sorts of things. And then, and then the big thing is that people are better and worse in an emergency than you'd expect. You know, and you never tell which way people are going to go, but ultimately they really are. People are always, they're never what you expect. They're always better than you expect or worse than you expect. Uh, and then the other big thing is uh, after whatever that emergency is, there's a really big psychological backlash. So personally, and then depending on the scope, all the way to worldwide. So that, you know, uh, Roseburg saw that with the UCC shooting um, that the drills after that, the kids freaked over and over again. We would tell them that it was a drill. We would tell them this is, they would freak. It got to the point where it wasn't worth doing. And so we stopped drilling. For two years, we stopped drilling entirely. We did it as adults. Um, and I'll have to say there was a psychological backlash for that as well, but it wasn't fair to the children. So it, it got to the point where we were actually just creating psychological damage rather than actually helping them with drills sadly so when when you say things like that i really get why you would want to do it but what kind of actions did you have to take to make that decision did you um so, did you talk to the fire marshals did you have so to I, I think it was just i don't know who decided that I don't know who was the person who decided that, but I know that it was decided. So, well, I, you know, all I did was go, oh, thank God, because mm -hmm. the first drill following that shooting was, was horrible. We, we put kids back weeks in, in their recovery. I mean, many of those kids had parents or brothers or sisters, you know, hiding under desks while somebody was being shot. So it's, you know, it's not fair to little kids to, to have to do that. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm just thinking that, that that's a thing that probably needs to be addressed in our emergency planning. Um, and well, I, and, and if you happen to have a niece that was talking to those people, then I, I would probably talk about what do we do after this all happens? I mean, once, once all of these things happen, what are we going to do afterwards? You know, it doesn't, it doesn't really help to have the president come out and say that you're doing good. I mean, I, it doesn't do bad, but at the same time, you know, the real impact is on kids that are not, you know, are often not even directly involved. Right, there's some comments in the chat about how uh, ad both adults and kids in general education classrooms um, freak out too and I think that's what you are alluding to in, yeah. the, in the active shooter um, thing one of the questions that I've had as you were talking was and you mentioned it here 
or maybe on the previous uh, slide, kids with behavioral issues and autism, um, particularly just because we know that they, they're they really reactive to change. Um, do you ever use equipment for those kids just to help them feel uh, safer and, and more? Uh, yes, is, is the answer. So, okay. um, you know, and I tend to use the easy stuff like um, like chairs, like the, the super cheap chairs or the or, or even, you know, the idea of carrying them down in their own chair works, you know, those sorts of things. I, I think that's a great idea. You know, anything, but ultimately it comes down to you've got to get the kid out. So if they're having a tantrum on the floor, you just need to pick them up and hike them out. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, in, in a real real emergencies, don't stop for autistic kids. Um, and and unfortunately, in a real emergency, with all of that sensory input happening, they're almost certainly not going to cope. So, um, you know, ultimately, the the right option is kind of to know that going in, and those autistic kids could be as much as my kid with the mitochondrial myopathy. You know, put them in a chair, put them in a seatbelt. Put yeah, and phone, make it part of the drill. Make it part of the drill. Put earphones on uh, and bring so, them down. For one student I, I worked with at one point, uh, we had to make sure that there was a picture of mom in his uh, go bag. And that's what brought him right back to, as soon as he saw that picture, he knew that, that he had to do the right thing. Yeah. So <laughs> the other thing is um, for what, what I kind of theorize, and it's, you know, it's, it's just a theory because I've clearly not been in one, but my theory is, is that the less cognition, the less concern. So um, the kids who are kind of very low cognition, it, you don't have any of that psychological backlash or you have backlash that you can't find or you can't see or you can't for whatever reason communicate about. But, um, you know, I think that there's a protection in there for them, you know, that they're, they're just doing, they're with the people that they know. They, uh, are, you know, yes, we did a little bit faster than we normally do, but it's not really a whole lot different than what they're doing. I have a question about um, practice for earthquake drills. And so what you've talked about today is, you know, getting out of the building, but then we do have drills right. thing all the time. So if I have a student that's, um, you know, in a wheelchair for some hip issues, but she can walk some. And so I'm like, hmm, okay, during an earthquake drill, should I have staff help her get on the floor and get under the table? Or, you know, the whole like, you're supposed right. to be near a wall away from a window, but then then nobody, they're not covered. And then the adult right. don't stay with them. So, so. Yes. Interestingly, um, well, my, uh, when I was trying to do this with that little girl with arthrogryposis, um, because I'd gone through and they said, don't stand in the doorway. You know, it's that's not safe anymore. You need to be underneath the desk and those sorts of things. So I actually called FEMA and said, what, what do I do for this kid? And they said, put her in the doorway. And I said, you just told me not to. And they said, we don't have any other option. So, you know, I, so my answer to you is do what FEMA tells you to do and put her. So what they did was put, said to put her in the doorway and then you have an adult stand over the top of her. Um, and, and theoretically that the doorway uh, is not any stronger than the walls anymore, um, which is why they stopped doing that. Uh, you have three seconds. What is it? Three seconds or 30 seconds to get under the table. Uh, and most of our kids in wheelchairs will take significantly longer than that to get under a table. Uh, and the last thing you want is for them to be out of their wheelchair, which will give them some modicum of a, a, a protection and on a floor, but not under a table. So the last thing you want to do is be in the middle of all of that. And so I know that some of the things that we're talking about um, are may go against what this let's say for the with the fire marshal 
or the, the other emergency planners. And I think that, uh, that the trainings that, are, that Alex's team are promoting are really talking about having those discussions up front and why it might not be the best option and to come to agreement on that because every building and everything is different. Uh, but when they have their plans and we have ours, uh, they have to somehow be put on the table so agreement can be made. So stand right. toe to toe if you feel that it is something that is, goes against what this student needs, perhaps. Would you agree, Sue? Oh, I, absolutely. And I think, you know, for me, I, you know, I tried really hard to find an alternative. I called the Red Cross. I, call, I ended up at FEMA. I, I mean, I'm like, how? what am I doing? You know, you're telling me to not do this and I can't get them there. You know, how, what do you want me to do? And, and they pretty much just said, do what you were doing before, but let's pretend that we're not. And I'm like, well, that's, I mean, it's really almost literally what they said. And I'm like, well, yeah. you just told me not to do that. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I, you know, it's like, I think that you do the best that you can. Mm -hmm. um, and you try to and sleep. Not, I don't want, this conversation is great. I don't know how much more you have in your slides. I've got bus stuff coming up, actually. It's. Um, and so we have about nine minutes. And so yes. feel free. I can do, I can do buses really quick. You go right ahead. I'm not, I'm just bringing about the point of the clock. That's all. Yeah. So, um, so the problem with the buses is the, the jurisdiction. So um, I, I don't know if you guys have the same problem that I do, but, but uh, buses are an entity on their own. Um, they're not in the school's jurisdiction. They're not in the ESD's jurisdiction. They're not in the therapist's jurisdiction. It's everything is about bus timetables. Nothing is about anything except bus timetables. Um, so for the purpose of this presentation, we're going to assume there's collaboration. Uh, good luck with that. Sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't. It's really hard with buses because the parents' expectations are different. We left him into his car seat at home. Well, I don't care. You shouldn't be. We allow him to fasten himself. You shouldn't be. We certainly can't. He needs a one-on-one -on -one aid because you get bored if his sibling isn't there. These are all things that I've heard from parents before and that bus timetables and routes can be set in stone. I don't know how to get them changed. I, if you've got some idea about how to do that, I've got no idea. Um, so things to remember, bus drivers don't have a view of the child and their job is very definitely the road. Regular school buses don't even have seatbelts for the regular ed kids. So when you're trying to put in a car seat, you already have to retrofit it because there's no seatbelts. Bus steps are taller and depending on the parking, more difficult to negotiate. The aisles are narrow and most walkers don't fit. Uh, and a transfer to a car seat, which I am very against, requires that you pick a child up and turn 90 degrees and put them in, uh, which is the worst possible thing you can do for your back. And I would prefer that they didn't. The children are different. They may be able to do something in the morning they couldn't do in the afternoon, and they may be able to do something in the afternoon they couldn't do in the morning based on their fatigue or where the bus is parked or any of those sorts of things. And then some bus trips are inordinately long, and so the kids fall asleep, uh, which makes it really difficult to get them out at the other end. Um, I don't know whether or not your school districts have bus driver shortages at the moment, but we certainly do, and some of our bus Bus routes at the moment are an hour long. So kids are sitting in a bus for an hour and, and we have, I think, two uh, wheelchair accessible buses that are doing things like the complex needs classroom and those sorts of things. And these kids are in there forever. So everything needs to be retrofitted. Regular car seats fit in the buses but the children should be able to climb into them quickly and independently by themselves. You can't hold up a bus while you wait for the kid 25 minutes to climb into the car seat. Um, there are car seats, uh, there are harnesses that increase support, but again, they work off seat belts. Now, the other really big thing to remember is that at 30 pounds, we're using hoists in classroom to lift. So we can't expect anybody, and really the parents as well, to lift kids into car seats after 30 pounds. You know, the, the big, you know, the big thing we forget is this duty of care to staff who will bust their, bust their tails trying to get these kids in because that's what we've asked them to do. And we shouldn't be asking them to do that because their backs are our responsibility too. Um, and then wheelchair buses are available or should be. 
uh, that allows the kids to travel in wheelchairs or crash tested strollers. So harnesses, there's all sorts of options, including um, the rigid one down at the bottom. So you put the kid, the vest on the kid first, and then you attach the um, the vest and the child with the seatbelt. Uh, then way more difficult for a kid to remove mid bus ride. So if you have a kid that that's what he's doing all the time is taking his stuff off uh, and running around the bus, then you can put him in one of these that's really difficult to get off. Um, they're actually not that difficult for an adult to get off because if there's a crash, uh, you just have to hit the seatbelt thing that's underneath their butt, but most of them can't reach that. So it creates five point harnesses and it, it copes with 30 to 170 pounds. So it's actually quite, quite high, but most of them require tether mounts. And if you look at the top, there's little slots on both, on all of them uh, where those tethers would tether backwards as well. So you would have to disconnect that in an accident as well. So there are car seat specialists out there. I am not one. So there are specialized car seats. There are squillion dollars. Um, you can get swivel bases for them, which stops that horrible turn. Uh, at the same time, uh, you can modify them. They have laterals, footrests, all sorts of things. Um, if you're going to use a specialized seat, but seat car seat in a bus, then I would make sure it swivels. So it's just too hard to do what you're trying to do without hurting yourself or the child or other staff. Uh, and all of those bottoms, they all swivel. The carrot one on the bottom is the 4K one. So chairs and strollers transport. Um, the pros are they're never transferred by lifting. So you just, uh, you walk them to the chair or whatever the transit option is or the stroller and they get in the stroller and then it comes in. Wheelchair buses have smaller routes than the big buses. It makes less time on the bus, but it doesn't always and it certainly doesn't here at the moment. Um, and then the, the wheelchair or stroller can be adapted for the child. It can also be used for several children during the day. So you can actually go backwards and forwards with the same one. They are expensive. Um, and uh, what we do, we have a couple of, of the strollers that are crash tested and we uh, leave them with the bus. So we transport kids in them, just uh, in, ambulatory kids in them because it's safer and because the car seat is too hard to get to. Kids, but generally not the kids, the parents see it as a step down for a partially ambulatory child. So, um, and I've, I've actually never had a kid complain about them. They're more than happy to sit in the chair for the, the bus ride. It's the parents that don't like seeing the kids in them. And, and there's something in that. I'm a bit with them. At the same time, you know, we need to make the kids safe. The other thing to remember is that it can't be the same folding chair that you're using for the evacuation. So unless they have a rigid frame, they're not allowed on buses. So the buses rules are that they need to have more than a single post in the center and they can't fold. So if they can fold or they have a um, one of the, the single posts in the center that can, can rotate, uh, they're not allowed on there. And they have to have the four bolted securement port points, which look like that. So there are multiple options. Most of them are just transit type chairs or transit type strollers. Um, you can make them as supportive as you need, um, but the securement points need to be um, are bolted in. At the, most of them are called transit options. So look for the transit option. And then ultimately, you know, the, the real answer to all of this is do the best you can. No one can do more than that. Um, some, some random guy from NFL, I think, or NBA or something, I don't know, some American sport. Um, anyway, um, ultimately, you know, do the, what you can, you know, sleep at night knowing that you can do that. So the other thing is, if you want the references, there's references here. And then just because it was the best diss I've ever seen in a dissertation, this is just the best. I, when I was doing this, this was the, the dedication for the dissertation. I just thought it was hysterical um, that whoever this chick is completely cracks me up. 
so that was I, I got some of the information from that but I I'd love to meet Aunt Louise and uh and I would love to meet the sister as well but ultimately you know uh that was a really good article so if you're looking for it that's that's a really good article all righty well, Let me, um, thank you, Sue. That was uh, very <laughs> informative and thought-provoking, and I, I think I may have come away with more questions um, than I came with, but they're smarter questions. So, right. so thank you for that. Um, I do want to, before we close, there's, Deb has um, placed an announcement in the chat box. Linda Brown wanted us to uh, know about a program called Hero Kids that um, OHSU is developing where parents and caregivers share information